Hey, uh, what does write what you know mean? Because I don't know what it's like to be a dude, and dudes generally don't know what it's like to be girls, but we write people who aren't us all the time. So when people say that, what are they actually talking about? All right, here's the thing. Real quick, writing and acting, they're kind of the same thing. So because I'm better at acting than writing, let's use that as an analogy for a minute. You can't act something you don't know. You gotta draw on your life experiences and use them to portray your character's experiences. Uh, for an example, when Scott McNeil needed to portray the trauma of his character duo seeing his Gundam get blown up, as seen here, <laughs> He drew on the similar experience of his wife accidentally backing her sedan over his motorcycle. I feel you, bro. Point is, you can map your existing experiences to more alien ones. Few of us have had their personal giant robots blown up in front of them, but most of us have had important things broken in the past, and the feeling is much the same. Personal anecdote time. Last year, I attended a voice acting panel thing run by David Vincent. He played this guy. And among other things, a few of us got to try our hand at doing a little onstage reacting to hypothetical situations, including death scenes. Now, none of us had died before, but the more interesting voice stuff was before the dying, so that wasn't really a problem. I got challenged to provide the voice of someone who just got splashed with acid, set on fire, and then fell out a window. Now, I hadn't technically done any of those things, except for the fire part. Pro tip, super glue and cotton don't mix. But it wasn't too hard to imagine getting hit with something and rapidly realizing I needed to get it off me immediately, think spider falling on your face, and the falling out of a window part, I mean, I'd tripped over stuff and I'd jumped off of high places before, combining the two emotions wasn't that hard. <laughs> pretty fun. So in acting, you kind of build up a repertoire of things you understand and can recreate. Fill in the blanks with your imagination and do your best. Now the trick is, in writing, write what you know is this. It doesn't mean only write what you've lived through, it means draw on what you understand to make your story. You might not know what it's like to be a half-selkie college student, but you might know what it's like to be torn between two cultural heritages and or two families that never interact. You're probably not a highly trained government assassin questioning their choice of career, but the odds are good that you've done unpleasant or boring work out of habit while mentally distancing yourself from your situation. But there are, you know, limits. If you're writing a job or background that hasn't really existed in reality, you can play around, but if you are writing from reality, it's harder to justify doing that. If you have no background in science, writing a science fiction story is liable to be difficult. If you're not familiar with a certain culture, you might not want to write a story set in that culture without doing your research. So let's talk about doing your research, because the cool thing about writing what you know is that you can always know more. One of the many fabulous things about the internet is how easy it is to learn stuff through it. Not only that, you also get personal anecdotes from people from all over the place with all kinds of backgrounds. If you have no idea what it's like to be adjective in place, you can find someone and ask. Or, like, if you've never had a certain job, you can find accounts from people who have worked that job. I am 100% not a Redditor, but I'll routinely scroll through Ask Reddit because the sheer volume of life experiences there is amazing and super useful when you're writing or world building. And on the more scientific end of things, you can self-teach to a certain degree, but you can also ask people who do this stuff for a living. Another personal anecdote for you. In a sci-fi world I was working on, I decided I wanted to make genetically engineered photosynthetic humans. Now, obviously, I don't know anything about genetic engineering, so I decided to hand wave the specifics of the genetic modification because that didn't strike me as story relevant. But what was important was knowing how much oxygen the skin-based photosynthesis would produce. I wanted to know how well this character could function in a low-oxygen environment, because that was potentially plausible relevant. So I looked up how much oxygen a square inch of photosynthesizing plant life could produce, I approximated the surface area of the average human with a little help from Google, and I looked up how much oxygen the average human consumes in an hour. I found that in order to make it work, I need to increase the efficiency of the photosynthesis by a factor of about 24 for a photosynthesizing human to get all the oxygen they needed if they allowed their entire surface area to be exposed to sunlight, but this was fine because I could hand wave that too. So that was okay, until I remembered that photosynthesis also produces glucose. So I looked up how many molecules of glucose are produced per molecule of oxygen during photosynthesis, compared the amount I'd gotten from my previous calculation to the amount a human body used in an hour, and ended up discovering that photosynthesis produces four times as much glucose as a human body can consume. That's obviously bad, but also interesting. It meant I needed to figure out a way for these photosynthetic people to sequester or expel excess glucose and therefore avoid the curse of space diabetes. It'd have been easy to just say, he photosynthesizes, shine a sun lamp in his room, but this produced a much more in-depth story element and one that feels more real. And I had no idea about any of this stuff when I started. I mean, the last time I took a chem class was high school, and I didn't do very well. But I can multiply like a champ, and my Googling skills are second to none, so it wasn't too hard to scrape together enough actual science to construct a viable thing. Not real life viable, but magic space future viable. Yeah, you know what I mean. Point is, it's better to do the research than it is to assume you know enough about what you're talking about. So instead of write what you know, it should really be know what you write. But like all good things these days, there is controversy here. See, when you're writing characters, it pays to include realistic levels of diversity. Or unrealistic levels, who cares? Making all your characters the same is a risky endeavor because it's kind of going to be boring no matter what you do. But here's the problem. You can't be all those people. You can't have a background beyond the one you have. So how do you 
you reconcile including a diverse menagerie of characters with the fact that you can't be writing what you know in the process? Uh, well, there are a few schools of thought. The first option is to not include diversity. You know, just in case you offend someone. This is a response to the second option, where to add diversity, you include, uh, stereotypes. Unsurprisingly, neither of these really reap the benefits of writing diversity into your character backgrounds, and neither is ideal. The third option is to include diversity, but to never address it. So like, write a black character, but never really discuss the effects her being black has on her life. Write in a gay character, but don't really comment on it. This is a safe option, kind of. In fact, it's got its own problems, because although you're reskinning these characters to fit into a minority, you're not exploring the actual consequences of being a member of that minority. And that's the point of this option, because presumably you're doing this because you yourself are not a member of that minority, and don't trust yourself to be able to accurately represent it. You risk falling back into option two, basically. An example of this is the, uh, ambiguously brown trope, where you want to include diversity, but you don't really want to specify what it is. You know, just in case. Now, option four is research. You want to include a character from a certain group, you talk to people from that group. Again, this is writing what you know by expanding what you know, and this one's done less because it's frankly way harder to get right. But again, the internet makes it easier. There's an unprecedented level of communication where you can just see into someone else's life. It's not going to be perfect, and it's not going to be as in-depth as if you were that person living their life, but it's probably better than nothing. Now, the controversy here is which of these options is better. Most people agree that two is pretty terrible, but between one, three, and four, it's a closer race. One is basically staying in your lane, and the arguments for that tend to be that since the author can't do it right, they shouldn't try. Four has the potential to produce some of the most realistically diverse stories, but the typical counter-argument is that it runs the risk of appropriation or even telling a story that isn't yours to tell. Three is kind of an attempt to strike a happy medium, but as a result gets blasted for not doing enough in either direction. And where do I stand in all of this? Uh, I try to avoid this problem, because I don't have a solution. There's a reason why most of the time I write fantasy or far future sci-fi, because in those cases I can construct all parties involved. It's not a question of being uneducated on real elements, because there's next to no input from our reality. But if I had to pick, I'd probably try for option four? Whatever, it's not my call. It's just good to understand that there actually is controversy around this subject. But so far we've talked about characters and settings. To make a story, you also need a plot. So what does write what you know mean in the context of a plot? Uh, not a whole lot, turns out. See, when you break it down, most stories map to things almost everyone has experienced. You get friendships and betrayals, romances or lack thereof, uh, pinning all your hopes on something and having it disappoint you, all kinds of stuff. In fact, the idea that you wouldn't understand a story is almost alien, because there are universal experiences most stories are built out of. This hardly seems like a problem, really. Well, the problem is, sometimes they write what they know too well, and as much as I love tropes, you can't build a story out of them. Look, we all grow up with entertainment. We see or read stories and we learn them. We, we know them. So when the time comes for us to write a story, a lot of the time we build it out of stories we already know. And that's the problem. It's like you're writing a book with autocomplete turned on. Look, tropes aren't bad. Tropes just happen. If you're writing a story, familiar things are going to show up. But there's a difference between recognizing tropes and building with them. The hero archetype just happened. But if you're writing a hero, he's going to be way blander than any of the original hero archetypes. And yeah, it's going to be a he. Here, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's this series I read when I was a kid called The Belgariad. And it's well written, and I've got a soft spot for generic fantasy, so I liked it. But the main character, Garion, is the most generic instance of the hero archetype I've ever seen. You can literally check off all the instances of his hero's journey without fail. Now this is pretty clearly the result of building from tropes, and the end result is that Garion is by far the least interesting part of the Belgariad. This is the hero you write when you think, I know how heroes work, they have these characteristics and do these things. And that's not memorable. But if you want to look at a character who fits the hero archetype while still managing to be vastly entertaining, I wish to draw your attention to YA protagonist Percy Jackson. I've complained about those books before, but I have no complaints about their hero. Percy is one of the most entertaining protagonists I've ever read, but his heroism isn't what makes him interesting. It's the constant state of near-panic disorientation that makes him fun. He does heroic things, but the first-person perspective helps us see how screamingly unprepared he is when he does those things. Percy wasn't written to be a hero, he was written to be a teenager in over his head. And it's great! And that's the point! The hero archetype appears appeared within his character, but it's not what he is. Reardon wrote Percy as young and dyslexic with ADD because he knew those things from his own son. He wrote what he knew from life, not what he knew from stories. And that produced better stories. So yeah, writing what you know. <laughs>